I am going to demonstrate binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. I feel there may be some difficulty for ophthalmologist who is practicing direct ophthalmoscopy to switch over to binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. But by mere practice, constant practice, one can master binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy and they will love doing indirect ophthalmoscopy to examine retina. Now what follows is, I am going to do a simple demonstration of binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. Now what you are seeing is the instrument binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. Now I will uh, demonstrate each and every part of the instrument. There are two types of indirect ophthalmoscope available. This one is a headband type. Now I am going to demonstrate the instrument to you. Here you see the headband cross strap which will be hold the weight of the instrument. This can be put over the surgeon's head and this is the encircling band which can be tightened to steady the instrument. And now there are various adjustments. This is a optical unit. To ad adjust the optical unit, this knob can be used to tilt the optical unit according to the surgeon's convenience. And these are the oculars. And this particular knob is to adjust the mirror to so that when, a, when the ophthalmologist is put the headband on his head and to adjust the light so that the upper half of the his view is eliminated with the light. And uh, these adjustments can be done for the according to the IPD of the surgeon. Now after surgeon wearing the headband ophthalmoscope conveniently, he has to adjust the illumination so that through the ocular, the, the illumination what you see should be in the upper half. Yeah. Okay, then over it. Okay. After wearing the indirect ophthalmoscope, the first adjustment, after make tightening the uh, knobs here, you should adjust the light by tilting this knob, either up or down so that the illumination is in the upper half of the oculus through which you see. Here you see an adjustment for adjusting the intensity of illumination, the light, medium and uh, uh, this is the strongest illumination. When a patient having a me media hazy, you can ha keep the intensity at the highest level. The next important requirement is a uh, table for uh, examination. The table, should, uh, there should be space around the table to move around. And uh, the height of the table should be convenient to the surgeon who is doing the direct ophthalmoscopy. Approximately, it should be at the high level of the hip. The next important requirement is the room should be uh, quite dark. There should not be any other light. Next is about the condensing lens to be used for indirect ophthalmoscopy. There are various types of lenses available, plus 20, plus 14 and plus 30. The commonly used is plus 20 aspherical lens. The convenient lens is Nikon aspherical, what you are seeing now here. Usually the convex part is towards the surgeon and the flat surface is towards the patient. It is usually indicated by white line and it is held by the thumb and the index finger as shown here. Now the patient is uh, made to lie 
comfortably. There is no pillow used. And the patient is explained what we are going to do. That we are going to use a lens and a light to see the interior of the eye. The ne next requirement is a good pupillary dilatation should be there. And the room should be quite dark. And uh, the head of the patient should not be either uh, extended or flexed. It should be just lying straight. And ask the patient to see wherever you want to. If the patient is not able to see properly, you can ask the patient to see their own hand, whether whatever position you want to, either to look straight this way or the other way. Accordingly, the eye can be moved. Now with the indirect ophthalmoscope, headband indirect ophthalmoscope, both the hands are free for the surgeon. With one hand we can hold the lens and with the other hand we can, uh, we can open the lids, as you see here. We, for focusing on the fundus, first the surgeon fo keeps the lens close to the eye, sees the cornea and the pupillary area, then slowly raises the lens to focus the retina. Once you get the retina, you, uh, you adjust the lens so that you avoid the other images, which other reflexes. And first, to, to see the patient, you can ask the patient to uh, see the, their own finger to uh, focus at a point. And if you want to look up, you can ask the patient to look up like that. And to examine the 12 o'clock meridian, the patient, the doctor, should be at the exact opposite meridian in this way. And uh, the patient, the, doc, the ophthalmologist should go around the patient to examine the entire uh, fundus in various directions. With the indirect ophthalmoscope, you can examine uh, beyond equator and with depression or a serata. Now we are going to demonstrate the axis concept. Here, a line drawn from the uh, mirror uh, illumination from the indirect ophthalmoscope and which passes through the center of the lens and the center of the pupil and the fundus. Uh, this should be in always in a straight line. Wherever you are examining, so when, the pay, when, the, uh, when you want to examine another meridian, the surgeon moves and you can see the same. The lens also moves and also the eye moves. So that, that this line axis concept is maintained throughout. If you are going to examine the 12 o'clock meridian, the surgeon should stand at the 6 o'clock to uh, 6 o'clock uh, from lower inferiorly. And in the same way, going to a surgeon examining the 6 o'clock as shown in this picture, the surgeon should be at the 12 o'clock. Like this, the entire uh, periphery of the fundus can be seen. Here we are showing the um, correct method of focusing. Now you see the uh, uh, entire picture in the uh, whole of the lens. If the if the uh, begin initially any ophthalmologist beginning an indirect ophthalmoscope ha can have difficulty. If they are seeing only part of the image in the lens, that means the focus is not right. The image should fill the entire lens as shown in this picture. Then only the, there is a correct focus, and you are following the axis concept to examine the entire periphery of the fundus, and uh, the person who is examining should always have it in mind that you see a double inverted image, left to right inversion and upside down inversion. Uh, beginning, the, uh, the, you may have a difficulty in uh, orienting with the uh, uh, part seen by the indirect ophthalmoscope. And in this picture, you, here you see attached retina and detached retina in one view. And uh, when comparing with the direct ophthalmoscope, you can, in, using indirect ophthalmoscope with plus 20 adapter lens, you can see an area about 37 degrees, a wide area at a time. Okay. Here, uh, in this picture, we are showing the, using the scleral depressor to see the ora serrata. There are two methods shown here, one holding with the thumb, and other putting thimble in the index finger.
method of doing the scleral depression the patient is asked to, to to depress at 12 o'clock the patient is asked to look down and the scleral depressor introduced between the upper lid and the uh, and the orbit and then the patient is asked to look up and gentle depression is uh, done and to see the ora at 12 o'clock position now what you are seeing is the temporal ora serrata which you can see by little depression you can see the retinal vessels ending and the ora serrata and now this is nasal ora serrata here you see the retinal vessels ending and this is the nasal ora serrata now you see a red lesion in the retina without depression it looks like a red heen but in the next picture below uh, with depression the retina appears pale and the red lesion now appears the bright red color that indicates it's not a heen it's an open a retinal hole after masking clear depression one can start drawing here you see a drawing sheet first you write the name of the patient the number of the patient and the date and usually you put your initials here and mark which eye you are going to draw and before starting the drawing itself you can mark the disc on the left half of the page as shown here and uh, this line indicates equator the uh, next outer line indicates ora serrata and the other one indicates the margin of ciliary process pars plane area and the clock position is marked this 12 o'clock is placed towards the foot of the patient and 6 o'clock is placed towards the chin end of the patient and this drawing sheet is kept over the chest of the patient and first you mark with a pencil and label all the lesions profusely after mastering scleral depression and mastering indirect ophthalmoscopy one can start drawing here you see a standard drawing sheet first the name of the patient is written number of the patient and date is mentioned next you put your initial before starting the drawing and indicate the eye to be marked here the left eye os is marked and uh, the before starting the drawing left eye optic disc can be marked in the left half of the page and usually this 12 o'clock meridian is kept towards the foot end of the patient and 6 o'clock to the chin end of the patient and it usually kept on the chest of the patient and you generally draw whatever you see there may be problem in representing a sphere on a flat surface by doing number of drawings you can master drawing improves the skill of indirect ophthalmoscopy you first you have to see the fundus and uh, interpretation can do it after making the drawing and you always use accepted color coding and mark all the lesions profusely at this drawing serves as an important record and uh, any time a colleague's opinion can be sought with this drawing Oh, no. Now what you are seeing is normal retina, this is ora serrata, optic disc, macula and uh, vessels.
Now we are seeing lattice degeneration here. It is characterized by sharply demarcated, circumferentially oriented areas of retinal thinning, most frequently situated between the equator and the posterior border of the vitreous base. Next, here you see hyperplasia of the retinal pigment epithelium, is frequently associated with lattice degeneration. Here, you see radially oriented lesions which may extend posteriorly to the equator. Here, along with the lattice degeneration, you see atrophic retinal breaks. This is lattice with open. Here, you see uh, another variant of lattice degeneration, which is called as snail track degeneration. Next here you see acquired retinoschisis, you can see the retinal vessel elevated. Here what you see here is called white with indentation, it is usually commonly seen in normal eyes on scleral indentation, the retina sometimes has the same appearance without indentation, that is called white without pressure. Here you see uh, pigment clumps. Here you see uh, uh, the atrophic holes in chorioretinal atrophy. This shows Paravascular vitreoretinal attachments may predispose to retinal tears in that eye, develop acute posterior vitreous detachment. This picture you see snowflake degeneration, which can be associated with lattice degeneration. This shows paving stone degeneration or focal chorioretinal atrophy which is usually seen in normal individuals. This is reticular pigmentary degeneration which is frequently observed in elderly patients. These are all equatorial drusen which are seen in the elderly. These are also again seen in elderly patients or oral chorioretinal degeneration. This condition is seen with increasing age, it is called cystoid degeneration. Here you see a horseshoe tear with subclinical retinal detachment, localized detachment. Here you see a large horseshoe tear with persistent vitreous traction. Here you see a operculated large open with a bridging vessel across it. Here you see a round retinal tear with a free floating operculum. Here you see horseshoe tear surrounded by pigmentation, another tear surrounded pigmentation which indicates that these are quite old tears. This is uh, shows uh, acquired retinoschisis, you can see the retinal vessels elevated.
these are small asymptomatic holes this again shows acquired retinoschisis with holes in outer layer of retinoschisis Thank <laughs> you. 